everybody. Hey Gerald, are you ready? It's Sunday. It's time to answer some questions. I am super thrilled with uh, with the response that we've had to the idea for for um, for me to help Gerald learn how to knit. And there's a lot of other people who are interested in learning along with us. So before we start, just a reminder that to any who don't know, I am not an actual knitting teacher. I am just a knitter, and I am a knitter who would like to teach her friend Gerald how to knit. I am a piano teacher and a flute teacher, so I teach lots of people different kinds of stuff. So I'm hoping that uh, that I can manage to pull it off here, and maybe you guys will learn a few tricks. Okay, I have a huge list of notes that I made. You guys are going to be so super impressed with me. I am prepared today. So let's get started. The first question that I had was from Kansas City Girl in a Colorado World. And she was wondering what the original purpose of the circular needle was. Because, you know, most most times if you see, you know, your, your mom or your grandma knitting, they were probably using things that were uh, straight needles. Sorry, things that were straight needles. Needles that were straight. And, you know, as we watch knitters now, we tend to notice that a lot of knitters are using circular needles. And she wondered what the original purpose was. Well, uh, in a nutshell, they're for knitting things in the round. And I've got an example here to show you today. This is a sweater that I'm knitting for my son. And as you can see, I started up at the neck. So this is what's called a top-down sweater that I'm knitting. I started at the neck and I started with a circular needle that was 16 inches in diameter. So I did all of my neck stitches and then as I increased my number of stitches because you know shoulders are wider than your neck and you have to add more stitches in order to increase the diameter of your circumference, uh, I changed needles. And so I'm using the same size of needle. This is the same size of needle tip as what I started with, but the length of my cord is longer in order to fit all of the stitches on as I go for the sweater. So as you can see, I haven't done very much, but I have done most of these are what my increases look like. As you can see, this ridge that's created here, this is at the point where I do my increase stitches at four different points around the circle, and that's what makes it wider. It's pretty cool stuff, you guys. Pretty cool. So that is um, generally the purpose of the circular needle. However, because the needle tip of a circular needle is shorter than a straight needle, a lot of people find them more comfortable to knit with than straight needles. So you can use them exactly the same way as you would use a straight needle and just simply knit back and forth. And so that's what I have here. This is a blanket that I'm knitting in pieces and I'm knitting each sort of scarf length flat. It's a rectangle and I simply go back and forth. So my two needles, it's like I'm using them exactly the same way as you would use straight needles. They're just connected by a cord, that's all. So if you just simply ignore the cord, you just use the two needles as they are. And that's it, easy peasy, pretty straightforward. Um, now I should also give a little shout out to Craft in Korea, who did a really great job of answering Kansas City Girl's question right in the comments and was really helpful. So thanks. You guys are awesome. Everybody just sort of jumps in and helps and I think we're gonna have a lot of fun. Okay, so I hope that helped. Uh, oh, there was one more question to do with circular needles and that was um, asked by, oh dear. I didn't write down who it was asked by. I apologize. Anyways, the question was, does the length of the circular needle matter? The answer is yes and no. If you are knitting in the round, if you are knitting a hat or a pair of socks or, you know, anything where you have connected your stitches 
in together and you're knitting round and round and round, it's very important the length of your needle because um, the shorter the needle, the the the, the short the ugh, the smaller the circumference. The bigger the needle, the bigger the circumference. So if you're knitting a gigantic sweater, you don't want to have a small 16-inch needle because you will not be able to cram all of your stitches on it. But if you're knitting um, a sock, you wouldn't want a 39-inch needle basically in a nutshell. If you are knitting flat, like we are going to be doing for the dishcloth, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how long it is. The cord can get unwieldy, so you're probably better off with a shorter needle. And that's why we suggested, I suggested the 16 inch, because then you can carry on with that to make a hat, because it is a very good circumference for hat knitting. And okay, so that I think that's it now for circular needles. Moving on, I had two questions about mistakes. Peggy Shock and Thistle Stitcher both wanted to know uh, whether I would be sharing how to unknit or fix mistakes. Um, and Just Grams for short also wanted to know about picking up drop stitches. These are really important things to figure out because you are going to make a lot of mistakes. So my short answer is yes. I will be doing short little tutorial videos on specific ways to fix or correct mistakes. The ones that I know how to do already myself. Those that I don't know, if I get questions on how to fix things, I'm going to go to my boss, who is Louise on the Fiber Friends, who knows pretty much everything that there is to know about knitting. And she's an actual for real knitting teacher. I'm going to get her advice and her help and have her help us out for those that I can't do on my own. Also, there I already, I, I know of lots of other really, really good resources on YouTube. So I'm also going to not always try to reinvent the wheel and just maybe point you in the direction of a really good video. There are some really great teachers out on YouTube. It's a fantastic resource. Uh, okay, so I hope that that answered that question. Moving on. This was a really, really good question. And this was a question that comes up a lot. So Colette, both Colette and Deb Ridge wanted to know about left-handed knitting left-handed knitters. Is it going to be more difficult for me to learn as a left-handed knitter? Do I have to do anything different? It, you know, I've, I've struggled in the past. People told me I couldn't learn because I was left-handed. Now, that, those aren't necessarily the comments coming from Colette and Deb, but they are comments that I've heard before. Now, I am right-handed. I There are two knitting styles that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the English method, and we're going to be talking about the continental method. Now, you may also hear terms such as picking and throwing. Now, once again, not being a certified, validated, time card stamped knitting teacher, I'm gonna really hope that I'm getting this right and not making a fool of myself. But from my understanding, English knitting is the same as throwing. It's called throwing, and that is where, I'll show you. The way that I knit is English. And so I hold the yarn in my right hand, okay? So I tension, we all know about tension from stitching. If your tension is too tight, you wrinkle the fabric because you yank it too tightly. So what we do is we use our hand to create tension in the yarn. And when we learn our cast on next week, I'm going to teach you how I tension my yarn. I knit, as I mentioned, I knit English style, continental, and so I tension my yarn in my right hand. Now, the left-handers are saying, but what about me? Okay, well, there's two answers to this question. The easiest answer was already given to us it really, really beautifully in the comment field. My friend Dawn, and Dawn and her friend Lisa have also a knitting podcast called The Codependent Knitters. They're fabulous fantastic, funny, great knitters. You'll love them. Check them out. Dawn is also a cross stitcher. So, you know, she's a, she's already a member of the tribe. Uh, Dawn left a great comment for the left-handed knitters and I wrote it down so that I would, so that I would say it correctly. It also speaks to me because it talks about piano playing. So she says that her LNS owners say that learn, it, it's, it, it's like playing the piano. There's no left-handed way. Both hands have a specific job and they work together. 
And I thought that that was absolutely such a great way to put it. Louise is left-handed. Louise knits the way I knit. She knits English style. She tensions the yarn with her right hand. And when she teaches people to knit, this is how she teaches them how to knit. There is another style of knitting. I called one method throwing. The other method is called picking. And that is also known as the continental style. And that is where you tension the yarn in your left hand. And if I'm not mistaken, crocheters also tension their yarn in their left hand. So if you have crochet experience, picking as your style of knitting or tensioning the yarn in your left hand may be easier for you. Now, Adrian, the third member of our Fiber Friends podcast, is right-handed like me, but she knits left tensioning her yarn in her left hand because she learned how to knit coming from it as a crocheter and for her it was a lot easier. Now what was also interesting was that I had another comment from Cindy. Cindy Jurek mentioned that she learned, this is how she, she writes it, she learned left-handed to teach her sister how to knit who was left-handed. Now Cindy was so impressed with the left-handed way that she continues to knit left-handed. Now calling it left-handed knitting and right-handed knitting is a little bit of a, mis a misnomer to me anyways because I would prefer to think about it as just which hand I prefer to tension my yarn with and because just like the piano analogy your left hand has equal responsibility to the right hand and it's how they work together. So we're going to just be ambidextrous when we knit and we're going to use both hands. Now that is all a very long-winded way to say for me to tell you I do not know how to knit with uh, continental style because my mother-in-law taught me how to knit English style or throwing that's how I knit and that's how I'm going to be teaching Gerald how to knit if you're left-handed I really strongly recommend that you don't consider it in any way, stretch, or form any harder than learning the other way, and you just go ahead and try to follow along right with us doing exactly the same things. Just remember that everyone else who is learning how to do this is also going to feel like they have two left hands or two right hands, as it were. And, you know, just give it a try. And if you really find it difficult and frustrating, shoot me a message and let's get you some help learning how to tension the yarn with your left hand because you know what i want to learn how to knit that way as well because i think it's always great to learn new new styles of doing things lots of times when i've been knitting socks i find that i have a lot of tension that happens down my arm and into my elbow because i'm quite tense and tight when i'm knitting so i would actually like to learn how to pick the 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 continental style of knitting in order to change up the muscles that are being used and hopefully alleviate that discomfort that I'm having. Great questions, you guys. These were really, really awesome questions. Okay, so I answered the left-handed. I answered the fixing mistakes. I answered the circular knitting uh, needles. Okay, so just really one more thing one other sort of thing that was asked of me and that was from coming from both two two commenters patty mcreynolds who i feel like i know because she comments on every video and uh and so it, it, it's it's really it's so fun for me to start to recognize your names and another name that i'm also starting to recognize and i hope i'm pronouncing it's is it rara or raras i'm going to say raras raras realm um, both Patty and Rara have asked about knitting socks and they're hoping that I'm going to get into, you know, the, the sort of basic tenements of knitting socks. And if you guys want to knit socks, let's knit socks. We have a ways to go first before we get to socks because we're going to start with our dishcloth. But you know what? What the heck? Let's do it. I love knitting socks. They are so fun. So, so fun. And anyone who knits socks can attest to that. They're super fun. So yeah, let's do it. Okay, the last thing that I'm going to talk about today is um, aimed at Gerald and some comments that he's had on his video about the yarn that he's chosen for learning 
a few basic stitches. And a lot of people have, and, and frankly, it's a, it's a good comment to make, and that's why I'm going to bring it up here. Gerald has picked, Gerald has chosen a very, very dark yarn as his practice yarn. And if you'll remember, back to last Tuesday, I asked that you purchase a very inexpensive ball of yarn that we were going to practice on learning how to cast on, do knit stitch, increases, decreases, things like that. And the yarn that he liked at the store is a very dark yarn with a fleck in it. And several people were quite concerned that he would struggle with that yarn and find it very difficult to learn on. And I think it's a valid point. Here's my take on it. Um, you know, the way that I teach is sometimes I like to look at all possible angles of ways of learning and different styles of learning. And when I have piano students who, you know, get frustrated with their progress and they want to learn it yesterday, I say, you know, think back to when you were a child and you were learning how to read. Did you learn how to read in a day? And of course, you know, the answer is no. And then I'll say, you know, what if you wanted to learn a new language? What if you wanted to learn how to speak Chinese? Do you think that you would be fluent in Chinese tomorrow? And of course, logically, the answer is no. And I say, okay, well, that's really great, you know, because if you could already do that technique on the piano, if you could already play that scale perfectly on the flute, you wouldn't need me anymore. You wouldn't need a teacher uh, and I wouldn't have a job. So I think it's really good that we just take our time and we take things slow. And each of my students has a very different learning style. Some kids need me to play their tunes for them. Other kids, I have to be very aware that I can't play it for them because if I do, they'll use their ear and they won't learn how to read the notes. They'll simply parrot it back to me on the piano because they can hear it. Other kids are great readers. Other kids really struggle. Um, everybody has their own style, their own way of doing things. And so I like to approach things in that I am never, ever going to say something is too hard. Um, I'm going to let you figure that out on your own. And if you are finding something is too hard, then we're going to find a different way to work around it. And we're going to find a fix for that particular thing that you're struggling with. Gerald really likes that yarn. And I have always, for myself anyways, I, if I'm drawn to something, I'm much more likely to enjoy working on it. If I am going to you know, have to buy something that I don't really like, and let's face it, this is not the, the practice piece that we're going to be doing, it's not going to be anything. It's not going to turn into anything. We're going to just learn how to make mistakes, basically, in a nutshell. He's going to learn how to make mistakes. And if he's learning how to make mistakes on dark yarn and it frustrates him, then he'll figure that out. And then he can go and pick out a different kind of yarn that will be easier for him. But I thought it was a valid point to bring up. If you haven't bought your yarn yet and you're already worried about, you know, struggling, then maybe you want to pick a lighter yarn. That's fine. If you love dark yarn and dark yarn floats your boat, go for it. And if you find it hard, we'll figure it out. You are going to make mistakes. You are going to make a ton of mistakes. You are going to drop stitches. You are going to have knots. You are going to have extra stitches. You're going to have less stitches. It's going to be a giant mess. So that practice yarn is going to be a giant mess at the beginning. But then guess what? The beautiful thing about yarn is you just rip it out, unravel it, maybe cut out a few of those knots. And then when you know how to knit, we'll turn it into something beautiful later on. Um, we are going to be learning, learning on our dishcloth. That's the cotton yarn or the cotton bamboo yarn that you picked. Now, Gerald has a few skeins of dishy in a few different colors. And one of his skeins that he's chosen is slightly lighter in color. And so Gerald, I'm going to suggest that after we learn the basic premises of, you know, the basic principles of cast on and knit and the increase stitch that I have to teach you, then we're going to go ahead and you're going to switch to what the, the dishy that you'd like to start with and we'll go from there. Okay. So just one more thing for me to share with you today, because I think it's always fun to learn something interesting. Um, I wanted you to look at the texture of the dishcloth. And you can see that the texture of this dishcloth has ridges on it. This is what's known as garter stitch. This is a garter stitch dishcloth. And 
the stitch pattern that creates garter stitch is simply when you knit every single row. If you knit one row and then you flip your work around and you knit back the other way and you flip it around and you knit again and flip it and knit, that is what creates these little ridges, these little fabric bumps on your cloth. So that's called garter stitch. Thinking back to the sweater that I'm knitting that I showed you in the beginning, I want you to ignore the neckband up here and you're going to look at the fabric that's created right here and you'll see that this is quite smooth, right? This is called stocking stitch or stockinette. Stockinette is flat and if I were knitting this on straight needles, I would knit my first row with a knit stitch and then I would go back on the back side of it with the purl stitch. But because I'm knitting it in the round and I'm just going round and round and round and round, I never have to go, I never have to knit on the back side for now and I can just keep using my knit stitch. And if I knit round and round and round, it creates that lovely stockinette, which is flat. And then the inside of the work looks like that. So that's the difference between garter stitch with the fabric bumps, the ridges, and stockinette. So I hope you found that interesting today, guys. I hope that answered all of your questions. Please, if you have more questions, shoot them my way and I'll help you out. So I hope you're all ready for Tuesday because that's when we're going to start. I really hope to get two short videos up this week one on Tuesday and one on Wednesday. On Tuesday, I'm going to post a very short video on how to learn how to do your cast on. And on Wednesday, I hope to post a quick video about the knit stitch. If I'm honest, it's probably going to be Thursday. You guys have to remember that I'm, I work full time. I work a lot. And so I'm really going to be trying to squeeze these videos in when I can. But it's super fun and I'm so excited to be doing this. And I know Gerald is as well. So Tuesday, we learn how to cast on. Practice, 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 practice. And Thursday, I'll teach you the knit stitch. I hope you're excited. And I can't wait to get further into it, guys. So see you tomorrow for Floss Tube and see you Tuesday for cast on. Happy knitting, happy stitching. <laughs>